Hello, hello. This is Meredith with a Y. I am your host, Meredith Willits. And today I was supposed to have a guest on and we'll just wait and see if she shows up. I know with the holiday weekend, everything can be a bit chaotic. Trust me, I know I am running crazy today. So stay with me and let's see what we can come up with. Hello, everyone. This is Meredith with a Y, and I am your host, Meredith Willett. Today, we are going to go deep, changing lives, and I am giving you the keys to the castle. Alrighty, well, we'll just see if she shows up. I know how things can be. We were going to talk about her struggle with being underweight um, and how she was relentlessly teased, but If she doesn't show up, then you got me for two weeks in a row. Um, You know, I know with the holiday weekend, I personally went a bit wacko with all of the food and sweets and treats and all the good stuff. Um, And I just went for it. I, I guess I was mindful, but not entirely mindful. And what we're talking about this series is our bodies and weight and, you know, losing the weight and all the things. And what is it? I think it's next week, actually, my doctor is going to be here talking about her practice. She is a weight loss specialist here in the United States. And um, her and I working together and really having deep conversations about, you know, quitting drinking and making mindful choices. She's really a proponent of the Mediterranean diet Um, and how, you know, I've been walking and actually I didn't even walk this weekend except for a one mile turkey trot on Thanksgiving morning, but it was freezing. And I just wanted to kind of take some time just chilling and not doing much. And I was out of my element. I didn't have all of my things that I normally want. It was 30 degrees in Ohio and I was, you know, just visiting with family And I wanted to do that. And I think that that's what we need to be okay with is not being super structured or perfect, especially when we are on vacation. Sometimes when I'm on vacation, I'll work out twice. Sometimes when I'm on vacation, I won't work out at all or I'll eat junk or whatever. I was super mindful to recognize that I was not going to um, have any alcohol, which of course saves you from sabotaging so much. So if you're over there eating the, you know, the stuffing and the desserts and the pies and all the things, at least I'm not adding another billion calories with um, alcohol. And so I kind of look at the alcohol as saving myself um, from myself, because I do tend to have a bit of a sweet tooth. And I've noticed with myself is that when I start going down the sweet tooth path, Getting away from it is just that much more difficult, which brings me to, you know, this concept of, hey, what, you know, when we do something, our brain's like, oh, I like that. Give me some more. It's that addictive sugar. It's the addictive salt that they are putting in all of our food. No one sat down to have 30 pounds of chicken. No one sat down and was like, oh my God, I'm going to have so so much steak today. <laughs> I'm going to have 13 hamburgers. But I don't know who out there is completely capable of eating, you know, three or four donuts. But no one's eating three or four hamburgers. No one's eating three or four, you know, chicken breasts because or you know, 30 pounds of broccoli. Why is that? Because it doesn't have those firing receptors in our brain of the salt, of the sugar, of the fat that keeps calling to us saying, yes, we need more of that. That was super delicious. You just nailed it on the, you know, dopamine hit. And, you know, this, I think that we, I mean, maybe they have done a billion studies and they just, you know, it's just not common knowledge, but I think that, and and maybe they're not telling us because, It's literally how the masses are moved. It's literally how the masses, the collective is, is controlled, is manipulated, is by way of the dopamine hit. 
you know, the dopamine hit is what gets us to smoke the cigarettes, drink the alcohol, buy the shit that we don't need, um, stay on social media longer because they feed us stuff that we already agree with that makes us feel smarter. Like, oh my God, everyone agrees with me. I love this. I love this feed. Look how smart I am. Everyone agrees with me. Right. And so I, I, I think that we need to, as a person, as an individual, we need to really understand the power of the dopamine hit so that we understand how food and alcohol and shopping and all of these things, you know, there's a reason why we love it, French fries. It's that fat and salt. It tells our brain, ooh, that was delicious. We love that. Right. And so I think that we need to start diving just a little bit deeper into understanding how these dopamine hits work in our life and in our brain so that we can understand ourselves better and not feel like, well, like I just like it. No, you don't. You don't just like it. This is actually a chemical reaction in your brain. And for alcohol, it says not only do you like it, is this the greatest thing of your life, but you need it to survive. You need this to survive. My husband said to me over the weekend, I was at my brother's house all weekend in Ohio. And it was my mom, my stepdad, my dad, you know, my brother, my sister, all the nieces and nephews, which I think there's like 12. I'm not even sure. Like, let's see. No, there's 10 nieces and nephews, including my kids. I mean, chaos, right? Chaos. Chaos. And my husband looks at me and he goes, if you don't drink this weekend, you're never going to drink. <laughs> and I was laughing because when I did drink, I had so much anxiety all the time. When I did smoke, I had so much anxiety all the time. Why? Because unless I had a cigarette in my hand and unless I had booze in my hand or to my lips, I was anxious. Because your brain tells you you're not okay unless you're taking in those drugs. So I was very relaxed. I was very relaxed. Oh, it looks like we have Lynette joining us. Let's see. I see her face. Popping into the green room. Hold on a second. I'm going to add her and then we're going to get into chronically underweight with Lynette. So Lynette, shake your head and let me know if you're ready. Okay. We're going to add her to the stage. There she is. Good Hi. morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm just holding space talking about my Thanksgiving weekend and how I was so much less anxious without drinking um, alcohol because I didn't have those Sunday scaries all day long, all weekend long. Oh, so, yeah. Makes that, a difference. A huge difference. So I was telling everyone that you were coming on to share about your journey with being chronically underweight as what a teen, as a child, your whole life growing up. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I actually, you know, a lot of weight is genetic predisposition and mm -hmm. I come from a fam, two families, um, that tend to be, you know, small <laughs> and skinny. And as a child, I was about half the size of everybody else. So, you know, when we're playing in the schoolyard, I always, you know, people wanted me to be, when we're playing house, I had to be the baby. And, <laughs> uh, people wanted to carry me around, um, you know, it was hard for me to keep up. I was the kid that was always picked last for teens. Um, and I was content because I wasn't into sports anyways. It meant I had more time to look at flowers and clouds and other people could catch the ball. Um, when I got into my teen years, it got to be a bit more troublesome. I, um, you know, again, uh, you know, boys were making fun of me. Um, girls would be, oh, you're so skinny, I hate you. I heard that a lot in my teens and 20s. And, you know, uh, you know, those are harsh words for a child to hear or anybody to hear. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be liked. I wanted people to love me, um, you, you know. And I know their intention wasn't for me to hear the hate part of it or take it as deeply, but it does take a toll over time. Um, and, you know, I did have, I was friends with girls that were heavy and, you know, just seeing who they were and their beauty and, 
you know, why weren't people, you know, recognizing us? Um, and I remember working really hard to get up to 100 pounds for graduation. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, so, you know, getting older, what I'm finding is, um, you know, I don't have the physical resilience when I get the flu mm. or, um, you know, if I get, you know, I've, I've had illnesses over the, over my the years that I just I don't bounce back as quickly as other people. Um, you know, if I'm working out or doing anything, it takes me longer to get results. I have to eat more, you know, where some people might have to cut back or change eating habits. You know, I have to do the same things that people managing weight do. It just looks a little bit different, but I still have to watch what I eat so I can get the muscle tissue. So let Uh, me ask you some questions really quick, because, you know, when, when I, so I'm a person that has to fight the bulge. I always had to fight it. Um, I'm have humongous bones. I mean, if you look at my clavicle, they look like tree trunks <laughs> and it does make a difference. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you have someone that has very tiny, like bones, you know, whatever there, there they is break a, huge a lot difference. easier. They break a I lot do. easier. Right. Yeah. So I'm the person that has to always like be mindful and watch my weight and work out like diligently neurotically. Right. And so let me talk about, cause like you said, like, that really just struck me when you said, Oh, you're so skinny. I hate you. Cause I promise you, I've said that to someone. I promise. Right. Because I'm like, Oh my God, I would give anything to not have to fight this all the time and not have to work out and not be so neurotic. So let's go back to, you were saying genetic predisposition, because I think a lot of people that look at someone who quote, doesn't gain weight, who, you know, doesn't gain a pound, no matter what they do. When, when there's someone like me, having a conversation or watching someone like you, what is it? Were you um, like, were you premature? Cause my, my daughter has a friend that was born premature. Was it just genetically small humans, like short, thin has a difficult time. I, I think that people need to understand a little bit more than we understand. Well, you know, I was five pounds when I was born and I was mm-hmm. actually three weeks late Wow. Um, I just come from little people. My grandmother was four foot 10 and about 80 pounds. Wow. Okay. Um, now that being said, I know both my parents came to Canada as young children as refugees. And there were times in their childhood where they did starve. Um, mm. I don't know if that factors in or not, but I know, um, you know, like my dad has, he's about five foot um, 10 and he's weighed 140 pounds his entire adult life. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say he's less now he's in his eighties now. Um, he's had a couple of strokes, he's had cancer and, uh, he's just not bouncing back from these things. He has no muscle. Um, he's skin and bone. He's eating a lot. Um, you know, and I'm, you know, it's the same kind of a struggle. It just looks different. It looks different. And so, you know, to talk to the people out there, because you know, there's probably a child like you in every classroom, Mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of people that are listening, a lot of people that are watching right now live, they have children that, you know, maybe they're pushing to be thinner and then they push their kids like be in shape, stop eating junk, you know, which is good. Right. Yeah. But then they look at the friend who can eat the Doritos, who can drink the soda, who can have the dessert because they don't gain weight. And maybe that's why they are jealous is because they are being shunned for being heavy. And then they have this friend who can do all the things that they want to do and can get away with it. Right. And so maybe there is a little jealousy and maybe that word hate might be a little bit more truthful than just a flippant comment. And that is why it might've stung so much because you did feel that anger. You can do what I can't. Yeah. And, you know, I think the conversations in the home need to be more around, well, just because somebody can get away with something that still doesn't make it good for you. Oh, Um, yeah. Yeah, You know, um, you know, because people can steal and get away with it. People have committed murder and gotten away with it. It doesn't make it right. And it doesn't change, you know, and I think we're not looking at, you know, I think our society is so outward looks focused yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, and especially, uh, t- young girls, I've got, you know, teenage girls in my life who, 
um, are so focused on their outward appearance and what, you know, they're almost afraid to leave the house sometimes um, yeah. because they feel like they're being judged on their looks. And we're, I think culturally we're missing the boat completely and not focusing on our spirituality, on what kind of integrity do we have? And, you know, what about nutrition? Um, you know, I grew up in a house with parents that, you know, they had starved as children. So we were on, you know, we lived out of the garden and mm. it was all about nutrition and there wasn't money for the Doritos. There wasn't money for the soda. Um, but it was sort of like a meal is what nourishes you. And it's where we sit down together and talk about our day. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's not happening. People are eating in front of TV sets. People aren't having these conversations with children. And, you know, the conversations we have with young girls about, you know, um, well, who are you? What are you, you know, our inner value, what our spirituality, our essence. So let me ask you this. Did you like yourself growing up or were you frustrated? I was frustrated. Um, I, you know, I had sucked at sports, so I couldn't keep up with sports in a sports oriented culture. I'm lucky my cha- my parents channeled me into music. Mm. Um, if that hadn't have happened, I don't know what would have happened to me. It has saved my life. I don't know how many times over. Um, I'm lucky that they were able to find a few of the aptitudes I had and channel me towards that. Um, but I didn't like how I looked if I compared myself to everybody else. I went to school, you know, my parents got a deal on a house in a wealthier area than what we had coming in. So I had to work to dress like everybody else. So, um, you know, and there were girls in my high school that got modeling contracts and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was very much a a showy kind of a place. And so I never measured up um, if I was comparing myself. I got out early. I left town right after I graduated. Um, I just didn't fit in and I never felt like I fit in. Sometimes I think that's a blessing. It was actually. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Sometimes I think it's better to leave and, 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 you know, not just morph into being, as my husband calls it, like a homer or whatever, where you just stay where you're at for the rest of your life. It was the best thing for me. You know, I'm in con, I'm still in contact with people from high school and I've also reconnected and they're like, oh, you've had the best life. You're doing, you know, um, doing it. Yeah. And I did all these unusual things that, you know, my life hasn't followed um, the same path that everybody else's did. Um, yeah. And it's been absolutely wonderful. I wouldn't trade it. And that not fitting in um, helped a lot. Uh, I read a book um, when I was in university called Reviving Ophelia. Um, I think Mary Pfeiffer wrote it. Mm-hmm. Martha. Yeah. Anyway, um, it talks about um, girls and body image and, um, the, they tracked some girls through high school. It was the ones that didn't fit in and that were the outcasts that actually went on to be, do a lot better in life. And the ones that were popular, um, and the pleasers and, and fit in and, and met all the expectations, they were the ones that sunk later or struggled later. Yeah. So, um, because they just didn't build that resilience and they had learned early that they needed to please. And so never learned who they were. Yeah. Well, I learned, I mean, since I always had to struggle, um, I've always worked out. So that yeah. is a very normal part of my life to pay attention to food choices and, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, moving my body in some way, shape or form. Right. So that's always been a part of my life. So it's not new to me at 40, 50 years old, right? Um, where a lot of people that were, quote, naturally thin or naturally perfect or whatever you want to call it, that I don't know if they have those same abilities or that same muscle to flex and go, oh, you put on a sports bra, you work out, you go for a walk, you have to eat chicken. I know how to do that. Since yeah, forever. I don't think so. Um, you know, because with me, it's like, well, I've always been a bit hyper. So I've always been a mover, but it's more... Um, it was never focused on staying healthy. And it wasn't until I started going through menopause that I realized I needed to work out to have muscle tone <laughs> and mental health. Uh, well, like, that's a huge, yes, exactly. Huge. I mean, and, like, that's, that's why I walk is mental health. Yeah. I mean, and that to, was to, a yeah. huge learning curve later in life. Yeah. You know, I find it so fascinating because you and I are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Like I'm five, nine and a half. Yeah. You know, and I'm I've like always- five, three. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've always had to do the work 
And, you know, I have a 25 year old daughter, I have a 15 year old daughter and it doesn't matter really what you say to them. It's how they view themselves. Exactly. And, and it's like, what do they say? Like the beginning of uh, feeling bad about yourself is comparison. Right. And that's where it all starts is you were comparing yourself to the quote, normal girls. I was comparing myself to the quote, normal girls. Neither of us matched up. So we did gain that resilience. I, I tell my son all the time. So my son, Brock, he's like allergic to red dye or something. Every time he eats it, he throws up. And so he went and spent the night at someone's house when we were in Ohio. And of course they had Sprite with cherry in it, you know, and chips. And so he spent all last night throwing up all last oh, night. His no. body wants more for him than junk food, but it was yeah. just, just junk food. And I tell him, I'm like, you know, like the universe wants more from you. And so that is why you have these struggles is because you are not meant to go that route and eat junk. I know that sounds crazy, but it's like your route and my route, we were pushed for a little bit more. Like you said, the resilience, the grit, the paying yeah. attention. And I tell my kids like you, when, when you find something in life, that's not easy, that is the universe squeezing you to, to do a little bit more than someone that quote gets it easier. And yeah. that's okay. That's okay. But I, I just find it so fascinating that you were just as equally frustrated with your body. You were equally frustrated and comparing yourself. And, you know, I'm over here probably looking at you if we went to school together and you're probably looking at me if we went to school to, and, and wishing we could switch places. Well, you know, I'm like, grass oh, you can reach things. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, and I think this is a conversation with our kids of, you know, the grass isn't greener. I was just talking to someone the other day and they were talking about how this person has this amazing life and all they talk about is these things that are so amazing in their life. But I know the background mm -hmm. and I said, and let me tell you this right now, you wouldn't switch places with them in one minute if you knew the whole story. Exactly. I'm actually, uh, you know, become quite good. We reconnected over the years, but quite good friends with one of the more popular girls in high school. And um, her life has been, uh, you know, there's been things that have happened that have been really painful for her. And yeah. I wouldn't wish that on anyone either. And, you know, when we sit back and talk about our high school time, you know, we crossed paths and, um, but never really hung out that much. But you know, she was going through the same things, but she felt like because she was so popular, she was on display all the time oh, wow. um, and had this, you know, I could melt into the woodwork. I, I walked, you know, we've had these conversations and I felt I was lucky. I kind of people didn't notice me as much as they noticed her. I didn't have the spotlight shining on me. And, you know, she had all the same insecurities, um, you know, I think teenagers see their little flaws or quirks and they're magnified. Um, we learn to appreciate them over time. And, you know, she just felt like she had a spotlight shining on them all the time. Isn't this interesting? Like, like why aren't we having almost like group talks in school so that we could all kind of learn this about each other? Cause we all hold these fears and insecurities so what is it close to the chest or the vest or whatever the saying yeah. is, you know, like we're all <laughs> holding on to these same things and no one's saying, I hate it. And even if that popular girl would have said, Oh my God, you don't know how much I hate this. We probably would have looked at her and gone, screw you. <laughs> like, yeah, well, you know, we I didn't know her. I didn't know her parents were going through a divorce, you oh, know, yeah. um, you know, and I had a stable home. My parents are still together 62 years later, you know, wow. there's all these things we don't, you know, people make a, a lot of, you know, that's the problem, I think, is people make assumptions by looking at outward appearances. We do this all the time. Yeah. Um, Hollywood has helped a lot, make, you know, giving us these plastic people with these seemingly great lives. And the next thing you know, they're hitting the papers that they've OD'd and then the story comes out later. And no, they didn't have an easy life. And it, it was very difficult. Or divorced. Yeah. Or, or multiple divorces. You know, taking um, their life like Robin Williams. Like you see yeah. that there really is a sadness behind the smile, right? Yeah. And I think that the more that we have these types of conversations, we learn about each other. Like, Mm -hmm. I think it's all about building relationships and sharing our story, sharing what we're going through, um, sharing reality. 
you know, mm-hmm. like, the, and, and what's weird about it is in this day and age, like you said, of social media, you know, where we are showing the best of ourselves, right? We're, yeah. we're showing the, the perfect part, right? Well, we're putting on a show in a lot of ways too. We're putting on a show in a lot of ways. I think that it's important that people like, actually, I just posted a video. It was a get ready with me. And I start off with zero makeup on, yeah. right? And it used, I'm then putting the eye cream on and then the lipstick yeah. and the makeup, you know, and I think that we need to show the vulnerable parts of ourselves so that these teenagers don't think, well, they woke up like that because exactly. we don't wake up like that. You know, like, you know, I have a friend who is just drop dead gorgeous. And her husband's like, I don't understand why you get Botox. And she's like, I'm 56. This is why this looks like this. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. there's, there's, there's a, there's a path to this. And so, but we have to be honest about the path. We have to be honest about, I'm 51 years old. I woke up and put you know, cream under my eyes. And then I put, Oh, I hear you. I'm 61. And (laughs) yeah, it it takes work now. It it takes more of an effort. (laughs) Yeah. And, and I think that, that when we talk about like, Hey, I'm thin, but I also have to eat thousands of calories to stay healthy and lift weights and you know yes, so that my uh, bones also, don't break <laughs> well you know and that's yeah and I had like two broken bones last year wow um, just stupid little things because I have no padding um you know yeah. I had a broken ankle and I had to have surgery on my hand and that sucks yeah um, and I think we do need to talk about you know, things like weightlifting for women yeah. is the exact thing that we need to combat osteoporosis, which is a huge, um, you know, life shortener, you know, breaking yeah. a hip or whatever it is. And, and I, it's crazy. I think what the heavy people need to know is the people that aren't, you know, our bones, um, you know, the, the highest risk, risk factor for osteoporosis is being small framed wow. and low weight. Because um, you don't have that force on you, your bones you don't have creating. That. Yeah. yeah my whole life I haven't had that impact on my bones I've you know like tread lightly on the earth but at the same time it's my bones haven't, haven't. had that impact that I need yeah yeah I have um and now I see what they're doing too as I have a friend and um what she was telling me about this kid who they're they give um uh growth hormones Oh, if yeah. they see that they're going to be smallish, that now they start to give growth hormones, maybe before the growth plates uh, finish growing together and completing whatever, especially in men, that they're giving these these hormones that, to try to push these kids so that they're not 5'6", five, 5'7", five, 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 to try to get them to a normal height, et cetera, for whatever reason. I... I doubt they had that sort of an animal when you and I were younger. No. Um, but it's interesting that it's like, I will give you drugs so that you can have a normal life experience. Or is it based on the health, like what you're referencing, because then that's going to be harder on their bones. I mean, and we were actually talking sidebar, and it's up to you if you want to talk about it, about no matter what women look like, we are, we are told to basically hate ourselves. And there's it's programmed examples. early. Yeah. yeah. And you have some yeah. examples in your immediate life that you may or may, I don't know if you want to talk about them um, here. Yeah. I've got um, some people in my life that are uh, young people that are transitioning gender. Mm-hmm. And one of them has been, um, you know, had top surgery to transition to male. Um, but they sort of, um, have come to a point where there's decisions need to be made about how much further to go down that road. And it's sort of coming out now, sort of, why should I have to have surgery for the world to look at me a certain way when, why can't they just accept when I say what my name is and who I am, why can't they just accept that? Why can't they just accept the way that I am in the world? Um, and this person has some very unique talents that they're um, manifesting in the world and using for the good of humanity. And why can't people focus on that instead of the transition part of it? Um, I, I, I think that this is such an interesting topic, which I think will span a very long it's almost like we're kind of in between two parentheses. Yes. And it's like very specific male, female, clothing, colors, work, roles, 
right? And yeah. I feel like we're in the parentheses right now of you either have to be this or that. Yes. And and this or that comes with labels. Either you're a man, you're a woman, and it comes with gender roles and clothes and facial hair and short hair and long hair and fingernails, right? So that's, we're in this parentheses of you have to pick. And then once you pick, then you also then get to take on a new name, a new pronoun, a new role in society. But I do believe that we're going to get on the other side of these parentheses, like the end, the end part, right? The caboose of this, where we kind of start to get rid of pronouns and names like there's yeah. like my daughter's name is um Skylar which is a boy or girl name you know mm -hmm. Emerson boy or girl name like and I was very cognizant of naming my kids kind of benign names like it's just Brock, Brock could be a girl you know Cody could be a girl's name um Skylar is definitely a boy's name and so I think that we are going to get to the caboose of needing any of this and you just show up as well, you know, it's interesting you'd say that about names because um, Lynette is actually my middle name hmm. and legally my first name is Graham. Oh, nice. I and I was born That's in my the 60s. Speed. Yeah. And I used that until I was about seven. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I got into, you know, school and there was three other kids in the class with the same name. And so it's like, well, why am I using, you know, Graham when I have a pretty name like Lynette? And no one else is named Lynette and I want it to be unique. And so... I just announced to my parents that was what was happening. Can you show me how to spell it? And, you know, I've never looked back. Mm -hmm. um, I've never changed my ID. Um, but what I noticed very early on when I was probably about, you know, the pixie cuts were in in the 60s for little girls. I wore overalls. Um, my mother, ref you know, kept calling, you know, my parents called me a monkey because I was climbing everything. When people thought I was a little boy, I got away with a lot. Mm. Um, as soon as they were corrected or informed I was a girl, all of a sudden my behavior had to change. And I noticed, I remember, distinctly remember that when I was about four, yeah. um, we were in a furniture store and I was jumping on the beds, you know, bouncing around. And I guess the salesperson commented to my parents, so that's a rambunctious little boy you've got. And um, one, of my, one of my parents said, oh, no, that's a girl. And all of a sudden, I had to stop. And <laughs> boys I've been will be boys. Boys I've will be get... boys and girls will sit in color. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I worked that to my advantage for as long as I could. And then things changed. But it's like just the name in itself and the expectations of behavior. Yeah. But think um, about that. Think, think about how that then impacts a person who doesn't feel that the frequency around how they are perceived is in mm -hmm. line with the frequency of the person they believe themselves to be or know themselves to be, right? Mm -hmm. And so I need to change all of these things about me so that the perception that the world takes of me can be more in line with how I know I am. And so that means removing my breasts or that means having you know different genitalia or changing my name or my pronouns or my hair or my makeup or my nails or whatever. Um, and so I think like I say, I, I'm saying is, is we're going to get out of needing, I believe, unless you want to, unless that's really in line with your, your focus of life, that none of the physical structure of self, physical structure of the human body is going to need to be altered to show up the way you want to. And I, oh, I, think, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I think it's unfortunate yeah. because like, like it, well, it's, it's funny. So temporary anyways. Yeah. You know? It's so temporary. Like, I just think it's funny. Like I would be more of a woman if maybe I had bigger breasts so I can change my breasts to become bigger. But if a trans female wants to feel less feminine than having a breast removal surgery, mm -hmm. Well, women That's do reductions as well, you know, all the time. Right. Um, and so I just, I, yeah. yeah, I just feel like we're in a weird kind of place where we're trying to figure it out. Like when we went through that whole target thing where it's like, oh my God, they're selling girls clothes to boys and boys clothes to girls. And then they showed like everything from the seventies that was like rainbows and unicorns. Yeah. And like, and I remember wearing that stuff. And I yeah. remember too, um, 
somebody, I can't remember, somebody said something to me as a child about, oh, you know, what's your name? And it's like, Graham, and they go, oh, that's a boy's name. Right. And my dad said, well, it's a girl's name if a girl's using it. And so that's how, you know, and, and that makes sense. Yeah. And what's a pronoun anyways? It's like well, literally yeah. a few letters thrown together. Is it really that serious? I just look at all this stuff and, you know, like and I, I look you at know, this- and I was sort of like, you know, why, why even like, you know, the indigenous community has something like seven different genders they recognize. Yes. Um, yes. That, and that's so healthy. And yeah. I think, you know, we move through life and we're different people and different things too. And as soon as we're altering surgically so early in life, I think we're limiting ourselves as well. Yeah. I do. Um, and it's also, you know, it can be painful oh, and yeah. expensive. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I just feel that we're, we're, we're getting there. I mean, you know, the Romans all wore skirts, all the men wore mm-hmm. skirts. And now if you're a man and you wear a skirt, you got an issue. I, I just I think, think it makes more sense for men to wear skirts than women. <laughs> right. because they, they have a lot more going on down there that needs room. And they have a lot more <laughs> situation. Yeah. yeah I, and like you said, it doesn't really matter how we show up. We're, we're demonized for it anyways. Yeah. So show up the way you want to show up. Yeah. You know, some people are going to say too much, too little, too excessive, too natural, too much makeup, too much hair. Like it doesn't matter. You should be, you should keep your hair gray. You should color your hair. Yeah. Everyone's got an opinion. So you really have to go with self. Yeah. And sort of what, am you know, who am I spiritually um, personality wise, uh, what are my gifts that I can offer the world? What skills was I born with that I need to develop? Um, so that I can, you know, you can leave the impact that you want in this world instead of, you know, being riddled with insecurities and never feeling enough. And, you know, we've got too much to do while we're here in such a short time. I do think that the new advertising, um, all different bodies is helping me. I love it. The Dove Girls. Yeah, that's I love good that. And good American, yeah. that the, uh, Khloe Kardashian jeans brand. Um, and there's a few others that show, you can actually pick online. Do you want to see a size zero model or do you want to see a yeah. size 16 model? Like in your, you know, as you shop. And I think that is so important because when you're not represented, you think that there's something wrong with you. So like yeah. for your, when there's somebody that's not short, you know, like small in stature and slight build, you're like, well, something clearly is wrong with me since I am not represented. I have no butt, you know, I'm, I'll right. never be a Kardashian. Right. <laughs> right. You know, and I remember when the Kardashians came out and when like JLo first showed up, I oh, remember yeah. people like, like, who does she think she is wearing that? You know, Beyonce, who does she think she is wearing that? And they just kept wearing what they wanted to wear. I'm I like, that's it. so yeah. cool because, you know, especially when we went through the heroin chic nineties, you know, where oh, everybody yeah. was like a, a hanger. Yeah. With, with Kate Moss and stuff. And then they come out and they're like, all right, I'm celebrating myself. Yeah, That I think is pushing women and people in the right direction of, I am okay with who I am and I am beautiful. And there I am on a billboard. There I am in an advertisement. There I am. And when we're represented, I also think it normalizes each yeah. body so that men look at those pictures and other, you know, and go, oh, that is beautiful. That person can be beautiful, even though they're not a size double zero. That can't, person can be beautiful, even though they are a size double zero. And so seeing those different examples of bodies are, constantly yeah is normalizing if you talk to men I mean I've got uh, you know I've got a close circle of male friends too and one of them over the years got around and uh you know I remember asking him over the over time like oh do you like that do you like you know that look that look you know look her and he'd always say yes um and so one day we had a conversation about body types and you know what people were attracted to and he said that you know, his experience with a lot of men he knew, it's like they liked all kinds of different women because they were different. Yeah. And that was the beauty. And that's what he liked about dating a lot of different women. It was because they were all different and they all had different body types and, you know, it was the uniqueness to him that was attractive. Which kind of makes sense. I mean, who wants to eat the same thing and go to the same place? Men like variety. (laughs) 
Yeah. And we I'm sure this. women are the same. Yeah. Like yeah. who wants to date the same person their entire life? Yeah, we're the life. same type all the time. And Very yeah. True. And there was, um, I saw, I don't know if you've seen it, but it was, they had an art. It was, I, I don't know if it was for jeans or, but the women were wearing just plain white bra and plain white panties. Yeah, I think and so. it was okay. These women are all 130 pounds right. and they all looked completely different. It was all different body types, but they all weighed the same. Isn't that crazy? And it was so beautiful because it was just, it was amazing because it was like, how can that, you know, and you would sort of misjudge some of them from being uh, as being heavier and yeah. some of them as being lighter, but they, you know, it was just the way that they're bought. And, you know, so I think our bodies are designed to carry out a certain role on this earth that's unique as well. And that's our vehicle. Well, um, I actually did a video about that, um, which probably was what spawned this actual series because I got, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if you know, but I'm a channel and a medium mm -hmm. and stuff. And I got a message about like the body is actually ridiculously important in our, you know, time here on earth. Exactly. And a lot of the spiritual um, community talks about the meat suit and they undermine, mm -hmm. you know, our experience here. And it's poo poo, like, oh, like oh. you want to ascend to this fifth dimension and the third dimension is low frequency. And like the message that I was getting was like, no, actually everything that your body goes through and everything that you do with it, again, back to our conversation is where more is asked of you and I, right. Than than other people who just like, mm -hmm. it's okay. And so like, this is actually really important, the body, you know, and I talk about here is it's not about the weight loss for me. It's not about the weight gain for you. It's about loving yourself enough to take the time to eat the good food and to go on the walks and to drink the water and to make these choices for self. Yeah. And to hug the people that we love and yeah, and all yeah, the I mean, things. because you know, we're very, you know, we are, you know, the whole spirituality thing. I mean, we can't have, we can't fulfill our life. Per we're here for a human experience, right? Number one, that's why we're here. So um, you got to love the human experience, which is the human body. The meat suit gives the us the ability to have that. Exactly, exactly. So we have to figure out a way to make it work for us and love and, it and for and, as long as possible. And, you know, yeah. when we're at our, you know, we can fulfill our life purpose for longer. So um, good. So good. Yeah. Well, I so appreciate you being here and sharing your experience growing up and, you know, maybe some people that are listening or watching today can, you know, sit down tonight at dinner, be it in the car, a healthy or, dinner, <laughs> or, you know, on the fly or actually, you know, sitting yeah. down at dinner with your kids and have conversations. Like, have you ever thought about that? There are different body types at your school or your friend group and, you know, how the way you speak about those different bodies is really um, important to your friends and people that aren't your friends and to be kind because we are all made up differently. And yeah, and how are we speaking to ourselves in front of children too, you know? Huge. That's the biggest, I think that's the biggest impact we have as mothers and aunts and Yeah, like friends. if you're sitting there going, oh my God, I'm so fat, I hate my body, yeah. oh my God, I'm so fat, or I'm so skinny, or oh my God. Yeah. Our daughters are, and sons are going to be like, shit, there's something wrong with yeah, me. <laughs> I hate my thighs, I'm, you yeah, know? Exactly. exactly. And we've all heard our mothers say something we didn't like. We've said things in front of kids too, not thinking yeah. the yep. impact it's having. I told, I, I just yeah. told people the other, a couple of weeks ago, I said some shit in front of my, my daughter. I was like, I hope that's not how I look in that outfit. And I was like, my daughter uh, called me out on it. And I was oh, like, good for her. oh, she's like, <laughs> she's like, mom, really? But I was in the throw of trying to like really lose. And so I was yeah. like, so proud of myself for losing that I was willing to trample on a woman who couldn't hear me and say, I hope I don't look like that. And I wow. called myself out on here about how that was really shitty and how, you know, having my daughters hear that or having me even say that is disgusting. And so I think that we do need to hold each other accountable and mm -hmm. call ourselves out on our thoughts and on our language that we are using and recognizing, like, don't do that, you know, and we are all growing. I mean, if someone wants to cancel me for being honest, that's fine. But I just look at it and I go, hey, I know a lot of other people do that too. And we need to we need to watch our, what we're saying or what we're even thinking. Because that was living that's where inside it of me. That's thoughts. 
yep, it starts in the thought and then it comes out our mouth and then we spread it. And so I had a negative connotation against myself and my fear of gaining that weight back. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, at least I'm not that person. Fear, 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 hatred, self-hatred, self-worth, right? And so that was a really good opportunity for me to go, wait a minute, what are you fearing what's your problem? And so, yeah, I think it's super important that we do hold ourselves accountable and watch how we think, watch what we say and, you know, love ourselves today to instill a healthy, you know, existence for our tomorrow, whatever our tomorrow body is, whatever our tomorrow health situation is. But I appreciate you bringing such a different perspective because everyone that's been on so far has been trying to lose weight. And so I appreciate you sharing your experience so that people can have that conversation and not say to people who are thin, oh my God, I hate you because yeah. we've all done it. You know what I mean? Obviously not all, but it, it is very common for people. It, to it is. It's such a common thing. Yeah. It's very common. And so yeah. everyone out there, stop saying, oh, I hate you to people that are. For um, any reason. For um, any reason. Let's it's put not love nice. in, you know, our world needs love now more than it ever did. Yeah. Um, you know, let's put that out there. <laughs> I love that so much. All right. Um, L- Lynette, are you doing anything that you want to talk about or have in the show notes or anything like that? Would well, you like to share with people? Uh, actually, my parents have just been going through a cancer journey. I'm happy to say they've both fully recovered, but mm-hmm. um, I decided to leave my job to take care of them. And mm-hmm. now that things are looking good on that front, I think I'm moving into starting my coaching business up. And so that'll be happening in the next few months. Um, But in the meantime, I'm taking some time off just to enjoy life and recover from all the drama of the pandemic and having parents ill at the same time. And I moved twice. And (laughs) that's a lot. So that's that's my life. But yeah, there's a lot of I've been doing a lot of writing, there's going to be some stuff coming out soon. So if you have anything email and let you know. Yeah, sounds good. Well, everybody, I will see you here um, next week. Same time, my physician will be here talking about her. When And I'll even ask her, like, do you work with people that are trying to gain weight? Because everyone's trying to lose weight with Ozempic and Wagovi and all these things. I will ask her, like, hey, do you work with patients that are trying to gain weight? Um, but we will be here next week, Monday, or if you're listening on the podcast on Tuesday. So thank you so much. Thanks, Lynette. I appreciate you. Thank you. Bye, Meredith. Bye, hon. Thanks for listening. If you would like to connect on a more personal level, head over to MeredithWillits.com or on Instagram at Meredith with a Y. For behind the scene footage and outtakes, please subscribe and come back each week for more Meredith with a Y. Thanks again for listening. Cheers.